artificial intelligence and the way it's used today also tends to build on what we call stochastic processes. Deterministic processes are processes where if you put in an input, you know what the output is going to be. Stochastic processes work in a probabilistic way, and you cannot easily calculate the output manually from the input. So that gives AI an element of autonomy, an element of working on its own. But Autonomous systems are not new. Yes, there's a lot that's new to AI, but autonomous systems are not new. Think of industrial robot, which beaver away, putting cars together, putting laptops together, putting mobile phones together. Industrial robots are a marvel. They are also incredibly dangerous. How heavy do you think an industrial robot is? What do you think will happen if an industrial robot picking something up, putting something there, basically operates only on the assumption that there's going to be no human around, and if a human is there, it just pretends the human isn't there and continues drilling. What do you think will happen? Chaos will happen. Do you think we'd be allowed to have an industrial robot that worked in that way? No. That is the concept of safety in engineering. It's one of the among the greatest revolutions of the past half century has been the development of robust assure, safety assurance systems and processes. <clears throat> and when we think about physical safety, we before we deploy something of this sort, we begin by asking, can we be sure? Can we assure ourselves that this is safe. And there is a formal assurance cases, there is a very evolved methodology for working through them. All of this works very, very well. Indeed, part of the reason the Boeing crashes were so shocking was because Boeing was departing from accepted practice in engineering. Boeing had not just done something that was legally bad, it had also done something that in terms of safety engineering was unacceptable, cutting the corners. So that is the wealth of experience we have in relation to physical safety. And the question is, can we read across from that to AI? Can we read across the experience we've acquired in relation to designing physically safe systems to create socially safe systems of artificial intelligence. That is the challenge. And why is this a useful starting point? There is one thing we get wrong about AI. When people talk about AI, when we think about how to regulate AI, we think of it either as a social system or as a technical system. There is a dichotomy. We focus either on its social side or on its technical side. But in reality, it is both social and technical. If we focus on its technical side, we may think about the propensity, for example, of AI to hallucinate, to in invent things that make perfect sense on the basis of the probabilistic models it's running, but that simply do not conform to the real world. As an academic, I have to say that hallucinations of AI are a gift, particularly to a law teacher, because if a student tries to use ChatGPT to generate uh, their coursework, it will invent cases that don't exist. And so you see, hang on, the courts never say anything of the sort, right? You've used ChatGPT, haven't you? But that propensity to hallucinate is relatively harmless, unless you happen to get a uh, 20 on your coursework because uh, the AI system used to hallucinate. In larger systems, the ability, or in more mission critical systems, the ability of AI to hallucinate becomes seriously critical. And when we think about AI from a technical standpoint, it's things of that sort we're talking about. When we think about risk and uncertainty, we think about the epistemic uncertainty, the fact that AIs are black boxes, we don't know what's going on in there, we think of the challenges of diagnosing, we think of 
transparency, those are the sorts of things we're thinking of. <clears throat> but from a social perspective, our concerns are completely different. And here, when we think about AI from a social perspective, we tend to work in a very, very different world. Suddenly, we're no longer concerned with the technical side. We think about ethics, we think about regulation, and indeed, when we think about the social side of AI, what the social costs it can impose. About, for example, parole systems in the US use AI. You're looking at a prisoner, you're judging whether they should be released on parole. Many police force, many prison systems in the US would use algorithms to judge the likelihood of reoffending. All those algorithms biased. They tend to let out fewer black people than human parole roads do. Why are they doing that? How do they have biases built into them? Very, very possible. That is the sort of thing we worry about from a social perspective. And for that, we think of regulation, we think of high-level ethical principles, but we are not looking at technological solutions, we look at regulatory solutions. And this bifurcation between the technical and the regulatory, I think, is one of the things we can learn from physical safety, is that that does not work. The two have to be tightly integrated, the regulatory, the technical, it all has to work together. You need a culture change. I can give you another example. Architecture. Walk around a city in Britain and you see these architecture from the 60s, brutalist statement pieces, absolutely unlivable. In the 80s and 90s, as a discipline, architecture began cleaning up its act and they began training the next generation of architects to focus not on statement buildings, not on docks and decorated sheds and the concepts, but on livability. Engineering has done precisely that in relation to physical safety. And that is a transition we must make in relation to the way we think about AI, the way we work with AI. We have to think about social safety and we have to put social safety at the heart not just grafting it on as an afterthought, but keeping it at the heart of the entire AI life cycle. That is the challenge. Now, physical safety as a concept is very, very well developed. We know what we mean by it. Social safety is a lot less well developed. At this point of time, we're not entirely... There's an we have accepted ways of structuring assurance studies, assurance cases for physical safety. We don't necessarily have that for social safety. But that is what we should be focusing on developing. And what I will talk about today is how that works, what work is being done, how far that work has gone, and why I think on the balance between techno-pessimism and techno-optimism, there's very good reason to be a techno-optimist. But let me start with some contextual pessimism. Surveillance, drones, and the police. Anyone in the room want to volunteer? What are your views on surveillance drones used by the police? Police use of AI surveillance techniques. What do you think of it? Yes? I think, in, on its own, there's not many problems with the way it's used, but when you start obviously <clears throat> exploring the, the larger picture of, like you say, biases, and basically make, making sure that you, you can keep a good control on who's using it, even within the police force, due to corruption, that's when you, it's, such a ma it's such a big picture, it's so difficult to actually come to a correct decision. So yeah, like I said, I think on, if you just look at certain shows as they are, I think the idea of sound is it's just another tool to be used, it's just how we use it. Yeah, so you, you see it as just a tool, it's a question of how we use the tool. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Um, it's not like you there is a lot of technology that is used in the United because um, although we are under the assumption that it will be used for a good cause, there is a chance that it could be misused. What's the protection against misuse? Absolutely. If you read the literature in this area, as I, as I do, 
It's almost like you're stuck in some sort of a multiverse. Anyone familiar with the sort of superhero comics where incompatible universes coexist? It can feel a bit like that. Because the techno optimists believe that the use of surveillance by the police will open up a utopia. Someone falls into the river. Five drones launched with pattern recognition technology built in. They instantly say, aha, the waves there are unusual for this time of the day. That's where they found it. The police crack team goes in, pull them out, give them CPR. A person who would have died has half their life saved. Isn't AI glorious? Isn't AI surveillance glorious? That's the techno-optimist picture. Last November, the uh, chief of the the, the chair of the Chief Constable's uh, Council of the United Kingdom gave a talk in which he was talking about the quantum revolution that AI was going to bring to policing. What will AI do for policing? He said AI is going to do wonderful things. Right now people hate us because we're not solving crimes. AI is going to let us solve crimes. A huge problem, you know, we have a tenth of a fingerprint, we can't identify anyone with that. AI can, AI can reconstruct fingerprints from that. We'll be able to find people, we'll be able to solve crimes that are going unsolved. Facial recognition. You have a blurry CCTV image, AI is going to be able to track that person's face for days across CCTV and we're going to go and grab it. Crimes that are unsolved are going to be solved. We're going to be able to use drones, we're going to be able to do all these wonderful things and the people are going to love us because we will be responding to the needs. But there's a transcript of that speech to a side and open up something which you might read in an NGO or in an offer to the God. Yeah, then you're suddenly in a different universe. AI is horrible. AI in policing is horrible. It's just yet under the tool of social control. Biases. We all know that minoritized groups are disproportionately subject to intrusive policing. AI is going to make the threat because now they're going to have drones hovering over the streets all the time. They're not going to be able to do a thing without being constantly surveyed. We all know that the police prioritize some types of crimes. So that's going to become even worse with AI. And the next time you go to a protest that the government doesn't like, remember there's going to be a drone watching you, taking a picture of your face, and you will go down in a database now and forever. Which of these two pictures is correct? And more to the point, perhaps a more important question, how can we create systems that bring us closer to the first picture and further from the second picture. That is the real challenge. And this also highlights the importance of viewing this as a socio-technical system, because the latter suspicion is not a suspicion of AI as much as it is a suspicion of police. Also, some modern society is in many ways bureaucratic and stratified. This is a devastating combination. Because it is stratified, you have individual subcultures developing in different sections of society. The police have their own worldview, which differs radically from the worldview you would see if you were sitting in the Greenpeace meeting. When you have AI systems that are being produced, which worldview do they reflect? And as we'll see in a few minutes, those worldviews can creep in at so many different stages of the AI life cycle. How can you social safety means assuring AI to be broadly reflected of the worldviews present in the polity, not just the police. I can give you an example of how police worldviews can differ. There is a concept in human rights law called proportionality. Proportionality is supposed to be a tremendous safeguard. Proportionality says that in certain cases where your human rights, where your civil liberties are at stake, the police cannot take action against you if that action would be a disproportionate infringement on your civil liberties. 
For the past 15 or 20 years, police have been trained in proportionality. They've been trained to use it as a concept. About nine years ago, a group of criminologists did a study of how police use proportionality. The results came as something of a shock to all of us who were thought, yeah, yes, the police are learning about proportionality. Isn't it fantastic? They took proportionality very, very seriously. They worked very hard with it, they thought hard about it, but their understanding of proportionality was very far removed from the way a human rights lawyer would understand it. And their understanding of proportionality, in essence, was about circumvagants, protecting the police, defending the police, and protecting themselves by assuring, by giving themselves a defense to any action that might be brought against them. If you think about it, we shouldn't have been surprised that this would happen. Now imagine the AI life cycle. And think what impact this could have there. The same is true of medical triage. There are actually, uh, there have been something like 40 odd experiments in the, in the UK, in the NHS, of using AI systems for triage. They've been used in various ways. I mean, this is a little robot called Daisy, which is actually designed across there in the Institute of Safe Autonomy. It's not for use, it's still undergoing trials, but it's something that the York and Scarborough NHS Trust are very enthusiastic about. When you step into a hospital, from the moment you speak to the receptionist, you start being triaged. Every step of your interaction, there is some form of triage going on, and deciding where you should go, how high a priority you should be. Each one is a potential point of failure. Each one is a chance for someone to get something wrong. And they do get things very, very, very badly wrong, as reading the medical law reports will tell you from just looking at the cases of medical negligence. AI could potentially solve the problem. AI can follow scripts, better analyze data, better analyze symptoms. It really, really has the potential to fix the problem. That is why the York and Scarborough Editors Trust are so enthusiastic about it. But it's also potentially a problem in and of itself. It's a very huge problem. Do we have enough data on all different ethnicities, different groups, different means? Or is it a... I mean, one of the things that keeps shocking students when I teach um, them aspects of the regulation of medicine is that the overwhelming majority of uh, medicines are not tested on menstruating women, not women of that age, because they just are not. They're not seen as being typical. So there's an entire demographic and they have absolutely no idea what sort of side effect it might produce on them. Now imagine those sorts of biases being replicated in AI. One of the points we see coming up again and again, AI is more trustworthy because AI will make fewer mistakes, AI will be more objective, and yet these biases can creep into AI. And that, once again, highlights the nature of the challenge before us. How can we structure systems of AI? How can we structure AI systems in a way that is socially safe? That guards against these biases, that tries to defend against these biases? To get there, let's start with the diagnosis. 2 points need to be kept firmly in mind. The first is that AI is a socio-technical system and not just a technical system. Society and technology mingle together. When you create industrial robots, you do take account of society. You know that a guy who's in a hurry will take a shortcut across an industrial robot's path even if they've been told not to, so you design the robot with a safe. Fails it, which means it will stop if it encounters a soft, fleshy obstruction and won't just randomly continue drilling through. Right? Because you know that is how society works, that is how people work. We do weird, wonderful, and utterly daft things. That is what it means to think of a socio technical system. 
you are not, a system that we deploy is not living in the ideal world of a mathematical model. It's living in the messy real world where it encounters human beings, their irrationalities, but it also encounters organizations and their ways of doing things. It encounters culture, it encounters law, it encounters ethics. All of these things are part of the world in which it operates. And you cannot disconnect the technical from the social. In thinking about how we optimize the use of the art, that linkage between the social and the technical must be absolutely fundamental. Secondly, the social <coughs> is immensely complex. I talked earlier about how our society is bureaucratic and stratified. It's also pluralistic and regulated. It's pluralistic because different people in society have different values, different beliefs. Let's take the example of an assisted dressing robot. We have actually at York been working on helping design an autonomous assisted dressing robot. It's one of the things that uh, the social sciences and the uh, engineers and the computer scientists are working on us in a joint project. I've been part of the project myself. You think, okay, fine, assistive dressing robot. What does it need to be able to do? Put, hang on, there are so many different types of clothes people will wear. Can we seriously have an assistive dressing robot which can't tie a headscarf on someone, for example? Could we have an assistive dressing robot which doesn't know religious conventions? Should an assisted dressing robot check if the curtains are drawn or open before it starts dressing someone? There are all these things we start thinking about once we start looking at the social, cultural context within which the system is working. And that is what I mean when I say it is a very, very complex society. It's not simple. Once you start thinking of a social technical system, you realize just how complex the social society is. And that aspect of the context of AI is something we need to keep in mind. The other aspect of the context of AI that we need to keep in mind is what I call the AI life cycle. When we think of AI, we may think of the algorithm, we may think of the data that went into training. But there's a lot more going on. We begin with the decision to adopt AI. And when we decide to adopt AI, we decide AI is going to be used for some purpose. Let me give you an example, not of, of a non-AI system, but nevertheless a computer system. The famous post office horizon. What went wrong in the system at the stage of adoption and specification? They decided they were going to focus on fraud detection. And when they decide they're going to focus on fraud detection, they're building on a certain image of the typical postmaster. That image is someone who cannot be wholly trusted or will defraud the post office. That was not the only way in which the system could have been specified. The system could have been specified as an assistive system, which is that most postmasters are trying to do the right thing, but are actually perhaps not very good with money or accounts. So what the system should be doing is saying, oops, something's gone wrong here. This is what you need to do to reconcile it. You know, if you're still not able to reconcile it, call these people, we'll come and support. That's what an assistive system would have looked like. Why? And this question, I'm surprised that the question has not been asked. Who made the decision not to make it an assistive system? Who made the decision to make it a monitoring system? What sort of social ideas that has, does that reflect? That is where we need to start. There's been a lot of talk about the use of AI to detect benefit cheats. There are a lot of vulnerable people in society who are entitled to benefits who cannot claim them because their lives are not in the position where they can bring themselves to claim them. We could be using AI to identify those people, people who could benefit from state support. There has not been a single governmental proposal to design an AI system to that, and it's all about using it to catch cheats. 
when we talk about the social safety of AI, that is where it begins, at that stage of the AI life cycle. And here again is where the analogy with the architecture becomes particularly powerful, because that was the transformation architecture made. So it's at the stage when you start conceptualizing the project that you need to put livability at its heart. And it's exactly that for AI. At the stage when we decide we are going to have a project to do the social safety needs to be at the heart of that. We then get to the next stage, specific or fine. What should the system be able to do? I'll have a slide of that uh, a little bit later on where, where, where we're going to it in a bit more detail. But specification asks what capabilities <laughs> does the system need? And this is fundamental, because if you want a system to be able, for example, to meet the needs of a wide range of people, you need to design a very, very different type of system from one that's just meeting say, the cost of those needs for one. Contracting is the next stage. We don't think about contracts when we think about AI. Where does the training data come from that you train machine learning models on? You enter into contracting by. Is every line of code written from scratch for every AI system? No, there are off the shelf components you buy in. And every time you buy in something, you're buying something which is going through a completely different specification process and a completely different adoption process. Where's the assurance that the components that are going to assemble the AI have paid any attention whatsoever to social safety? We then get to the stage of development. And like architecture, this is again where we need a cultural transformation. How much training do computer scientists get on sociology. How, what do they know about understanding social needs? At the PhD level, at the doctoral level, we're starting off, we now have doctoral training centers, York has one, which was just getting up and running called Saints, which bring together the arts and humanities, social sciences, and uh, computer science and engineering to create a new generation of interdisciplinary thinkers and scholars. But that's at the doctoral level, not at the post, not at the postgrad level, not at the undergrad level. That's the sort of change that needs to happen. You need people who are able to see this, the development of the AI, not as a technical problem, but as a socio-technical problem. And then we get to deployment. What does AI deployment look like? Here's the system. Got it. No. AI deployment needs a process of monitoring, of assurance, of testing. You need to test for social safety. You need to run, you need to test, you need to review. All of that needs to be built into the deployment plan. Deployment plans currently typically look at cost benefit and things of that sort. But not at safety. That, again, needs to be at the heart of the And then assurance. This, I think, as I said, I think this is one of engineering's greatest contributions, the concept of safety assurance. It's such a well-developed methodology, much happening here at York at the Centre for Assuring Autonomy, as it happens. But it's such a very, very well-developed methodology. It is not at all challenging to take it and adapt it to AI. These other steps are the challenging ones. Because they are the ones where we have simply not been asking the right questions. And so what does the framework look like? Uh, <clears throat> I want to leave lots of time for discussion, so I will try not to take too much longer on this. <coughs> What 
what I'm going to talk to you about now is work we've done at York. Not just to blow York's trumpet. I mean, it's always nice to blow York's trumpet, but not just to blow York's trumpet. It's because this work is genuinely exciting. It's being picked up in Canada, it's being picked up elsewhere, and seen as something that potentially can help deal with real issues that we're currently facing. We call the framework SLEEK, and I'll explain that in a moment. The idea behind this is that safe AI must be responsive to social, legal, ethical, empathetic, and cultural norms. These norms are assessed empirically. You don't get a bunch of philosophers together and say, what? I mean, sorry, no, no disrespect to philosophers. Philosophers have been involved in helping us develop this uh, system, but it's not what, say, tenured professors of philosophy at Ivy League universities or at Russell Group universities think the norms ought to be. It's an empirical analysis of what the norms in the relevant society actually are. And these norms then have to be embedded into every stage of the AI lifecycle. I'll give you a very brief run through of how that works. <laughs> we have a five stage process where you begin by identifying norms, mapping them onto the capabilities of the AI, identifying where the AI's operation might generate concerns about its social safety, seen from the point of view of sleep norms, identifying and resolving those conflicts, and then labeling and reassessing rules. What does this mean in practice? Here's an example of how we might do it. Let's say we're looking at a particular, let, let's take assisted dressing robots as our example, or let's take a police surveillance, let's take police surveillance drones as our example. Now, this will work very well with them. You look to a whole range of sources, you'd start by asking what rights do people actually have in relation to surveillance? What are the obligations of the police? You'd look at national law, you'd look at international conventions, you'd look at ethical documents, you know, guidance provide what are the codes of ethics that of professional ethics that bind police people. <clears throat> you might look at ethical theories to flesh some of that out. You'd look at codes of conduct, you'd look at standards, you'd look at policing protocol, you'd look at all this mass of data, and from that you'd be trying to abstract what are the explicit and implicit norms that the police are expected to live by. But you wouldn't stop there. You wouldn't stop by just asking what the police's standards are. You'd go to the other end as well and look at the community's expectations. So you might look at religious customs, cultural and social texts. You would definitely engage with the community, ask them what issues they face. This is the point to introducing AI is to be more objective. It's not to replicate existing harmful practices. So you engage, understand from the relevant community what practices are harmful, what practices are helpful. Again, not just what professors of criminal law, criminology at York or elsewhere think. It would be genuine community engagement. You may seek input from domain experts, but you would definitely seek input from members of the community. By domain experts, we mean think, for example, if you're thinking coming up with a parole system. You might go speak to the Innocence Project. What are the challenges they see in relation to parole cases? What are the most common reasons why parole cases are wrongly rejected? There's a pretty horrendous example a few years ago. Michael Andrew Malkinson was wrongly convicted of rape. He had a minimum tariff of seven years set upon him. He served 17. Why did he serve 17? Because he refused to engage with rehabilitation. He kept insisting he was innocent. Because he kept insisting he was innocent, he clearly hadn't faced up to the gravity of his crime, therefore he had in jail, he must stay. It wasn't until convincing evidence of his innocence emerged that he was finally exonerated 17 years later. Now that's a classic example where you say something is going really, really badly wrong with the system. And that is something we absolutely must not replicate in an AI because that would not be socially safe. 
And so there you'd speak to domain experts, you'd speak to people involved in things like the Innocence Project, you'd speak to people involved in efforts to document miscarriages of justice, people who work with the Criminal Cases Review Commission, and you'd try to understand what are they telling us we should be doing. So that is the sort of work you would do in the first stage of the process to understand what the relevant norms are. And you can see how we're starting to widen the conversation because at the stage of adoption and specification, it's no longer five civil servants of the Ministry of Justice specifying. We're having a much, much, much wider conversation in relation to what things should look like. We then relate that to capabilities. This I've done on the basis of an assistive dressing robot. <coughs> Let's say you want the assistive dressing robot to be able to tell if the person is distressed. Imagine your assistive dressing robots are going to be replacing human carers, or rather, they're going to be not quite replacing human carers because we don't have enough human carers, so people don't get dressings at all. It's going to be substituting for the human carers we don't have. A human carer, if they saw someone in a distressed state, would say, all right, time to get changed. Chop, chop, come on up. That's not what they do, right? That's absolutely not what they do. That's not what they be expected to do. They have to admit a robot, assisted dressing robot, not to do that. To do that, you need to build in some sort of psychological detection component. We can't actually do that. We, can, we have technology that can, to a reasonable degree of certainty, draw inferences as to a person's psychological state from their facial features. But more than that, you also, what you need to do is you need to, it would need to have the sensors to detect the tone of voice, to detect face, to detect the face, and it would also need to fall back if it thinks there's a risk, but is uncertain, put in the media or to support so a human being can look at the person and then instruct, uh, decide what to do. That's one simple example. I mean, nobody was thinking of doing this, our project sort of came up with the actually you're going to need to do this if you seriously want to be able to advise it to address it. <clears throat> and that's the classic example. You don't start off with the capabilities the robot has to say what it can do. You start off with what you want the robot to do, work out the relevant sleep norms for that, work out the relevant norms, and then think about what capabilities the, the autonomous agent needs to have to be able to discharge those functions in a socially safe and sleep compliant. And then the final steps. You carry out an um, impact assessment. Once you've done this, you start saying, right, this is the machine we've created. Now let's run through various scenarios. You might work with the existing professionals. You might sort of work with them. What are the sort of challenging scenarios you're faced right now? <coughs> let's run a simulation of how Mr. Assistant Dressing Robot here to deal with that challenging scenario. And then you identify conflicts, resolve them, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. All this, remember, is being translated into a programming framework. It's not just ethical principles. You're programming this into a robot. Uh, computer scientists that you have devised a programming language capable of doing this, which we are uh, using in this assistive dressing robot project. And once that's done, to wrap it all up, you do your actual assurance case. These are the properties we want the AI system to have for us to be sure that it is socially safe. On what basis do we hold a justified belief in relation to each of these properties? That it holds those properties. We can do this. We are doing it in relation to the asset addressing robot. It's possible. It's eminently feasible. This is why there is, this is a time to be a techno optimist. Because it is a challenge, but it is a challenge that people are working on, and it, we have the rough contours of an approach to resolving the challenge. We can make AI socially safe. All that we need is the will to do so and the pressure that is placed on people who might not otherwise be willing to spend the time on money to do this. 
AI can be a really, really powerful vehicle for social good. We have concerns. The concerns aren't just about the technology. The concerns are also about the society that makes the decision to use AI for particular purposes and not others. Getting to socially safe AI therefore requires not just better technology, it requires a social and cultural shift in how we think about the AI lifecycle. Making that shift is within our grasp, and social safety absolutely must be at the heart of our agenda for AI. Thank you. I have a little microphone for questions in the room and then we'll check if there are any online. So just raise your hand and ask away. I have a little mic though. You will have to talk. Yeah, just Sorry, start talking. I'm a, I'm a geriatric. Um, you want me to hold it? Just no, hold just hold it, it yeah. I am extremely grateful to you. I was a little bit apprehensive. I was tipped off for this lecture by a grandson who went to a similar, well, another AI lecture in Leeds University. I knew I would be the only representative of the geriatric tendency, and I was a bit apprehensive. But I follow you completely from beginning to end, and thank you very much indeed. Uh, I might be able, uh, in due course, if this suits everyone, to make a little contribution from the safety act aspect mm -hmm. uh, from the 1960s, early 60s. I did my articles as a lawyer ah. with the chief solicitor of the British Railways Board. My first stint was in the litigation department. So I was introduced to health and safety at a very early stage. In those days, on average, between 300 and 350 railwaymen lost their lives every year through industrial railway accidents. It was a great struggle to keep the num to try and minimize the numbers, but in almost invariably, the cause of the problem was that the people working on the permanent way were reluctant to accept restrictions on what they did and always took the shortcut. I won't go into details, but that was largely responsible for the very high incidence of death and injuries. And uh, it was very hard work controlling that. Uh, I don't know what today's figures are, but they're certainly not 300 to 350. Nobody knows. So I had an introduction to that and the problems of, of dealing with it. And uh, today we have a different problem, but uh, you have indicated the way forward. Thank you very much. Um, the, the similar issues with steel erectors who would never wear a safety harness and would occasionally fall to their deaths because they weren't wearing a safety harness. Um, yes, uh, a lot of work has been done on forcing a health and safety culture, and part of it was just finding companies if they let a steam worker go up without wearing a safety harness. Mm. The point was if the, the view that the health and safety executive at that time took was that if they do not wear one, you must sack them because you cannot, uh, it is your job to refuse to allow them to put their life at yeah. risk. Yeah. Yeah, that, was, that was again a culture change. Mm -hmm. yeah, Thank you. We have one question from online, so I'm going to run through the back today. And let her read out the question. It says, could you explain what control curtains means? Ah, it just means control the curtains, draw them or open them, close them, etc. So I think that's in part in regards to the dressing room. Yeah, yeah, that's to make yeah, that sure was, that the curtains yeah. in the room are, are closed when someone gets undressed. Because yeah, I'll, I'll, go back, I'll go back to that, yeah, absolutely. So we were thinking. If you think of the norm of privacy and the importance of the user's privacy, part of the respecting the user's privacy, which we see as part of social safety, must be, and this is just an illustrative example, are the curtains open? 
will someone be able to see in while you're addressing the puzzle? If so, close the curtains, pull down the blinds, or do something like that. Anyone else? One more question before. Oh, okay, two more questions. I'm going for the say first and then pass it over. It is a more generic question. In your opinion, who do you think should take responsibility if uh, there is an accidental complication, complication or a negative consequence in an AI system? For example, getting hurt by a robot, as you mentioned in the beginning of your talk. So I think in terms of who should take responsibility, there are a range of different ways in which you can view responsibility. The first is responsibility for compensating the person for the harm they've suffered as a result of the accident. I would strongly be for compulsory insurance to deal with that problem because you cannot let it, as we do for vehicles. For vehicles, technically, there are a lot, for motor vehicles, we have a system of compulsory road insurance uh, as a result of accident, compulsory third party liability insurance, as a result of which, if you're in an accident, you have a reassurance that you will be covered by someone's insurance policy. In terms of actually making sure they get compensation, I'd be for a comprehensive insurance policy. So you just get the money from an insurer, and then the insurers can battle it out as between themselves how they apportion liability. But I think the other uh, dimension of responsibility is understanding why things went wrong and fixing it. And that, I think, should be the basis of an open inquiry. Depending on the, if, it depends on the seriousness of the accident, but where you have accidents, I think there should actually be an inquiry to where they did go wrong. Was something wrong with the deployment? Was something wrong with one of the modules that were plugged in? Because it's real, if something was wrong in something you bought, say so you bought a training data set which was flawed, and because that was flawed, the patterns it detects are wrong. When there was an accident involving a self-driving car in the US where the difficulty was when it saw a woman wheeling a bicycle across the road on a sunny day, it thought that was actually a plastic bag. And so it just drove through her. Why did the pattern detection fail? That's the heart of what we need to get to. Why did the pattern detection fail? Where did it go wrong? Because we need to spot where it went wrong in order to trace where else it has gone wrong. I'm taking my cue here from epidemiology. I do work on regulation, so I work across a whole range of areas. Think of how food poisoning works. We have fantastic models and techniques that we can use to trace the origin of a food poisoning outbreak. And part of that is to make sure that the people who did it are held to account for having let unsafe food enter the food chain. But part of it is also tracking down where, what else could possibly have been contaminated and grabbing hold of it before anyone else can be hurt. Right? So I think when we think about responsibility, we need to separate out the compensatory side of responsibility, which is best done through compulsory ins liability insurance. And we need to separate that out from the investigative side of responsibility, where I think we have plenty of models from other regulatory bodies, health and safety, food, safe, food safety and so on, that we can draw on <coughs> to better, uh, I suppose we're thinking of responsibility in a forensic sense or in an investigative process. Does that answer your question? Yes. Is it okay if we keep the last question for after the coffee? So I draw it to a close on time and then we can all have a conversation. Uh, first of all, thank you for the questions. I know it's always a bit of a brave exercise to do in a big room, so that was excellent. I'm just going to go back to my slides quickly. Um, so just to talk you guys through the rest of this. Um, just first of all, thank you for this really good lecture. Um, I learned a lot about the AI and life cycle, which I've never heard before, and the sleep. Um, I thought that was really interesting. So thanks again for the presentation. <laughs> just to let people in the room and also online know, so we have been gathering feedback, and it just doesn't disappear in the ether of things. So I just kind of wanted to feedback what this means. So we had so far three talks already. And these are kind of just some of the stats. I'm a business person. I do like my numbers in the end. Um, but it's quite impressive. So, so far we had 208 people joining us online, 155 plus joining us face to face at different events. And all these events are recorded. I just want to repeat that because I keep getting emails, people saying, I missed this. How can I see this? They're all recorded and freely available online. And we actually seem to have a very good amount of views on these. Um, what we try to do is the feedback we've been getting about what topics you want to hear. Um, I initially went through with a couple of colleagues, but just to visualize it a bit, we put it in a really cheap, free, available um, app. 
and in a word club. What this means is it picks up on the most repeated words. Just to kind of highlight what we didn't find is very outstanding topics with the exception of the word AI. All the other ones were quite evenly distributed, so we had a bit of a challenge to kind of find which topics to cover next. So we kind of agreed we're trying to have it as diverse as possible. And how we're going to try to do this is we're trying to give access um, to additional information, so additional events in town which might be around AI, but also additional material we have from the speakers. So when they have something they're quite passionate about, we're trying to share that. So when you get an email in roughly three weeks time about this event, will it contain information about the link, uh, but also information about additional material. Also, we have decided for the final event in April, we're going to have a panel discussion. So instead of just being one speaker, we're going to have a panel of speakers and they're from a variety of industries. So one will be around AI and climate change, one will be around AI and tech and experiences, and the final one, I'm still waiting for a confirmation, so I can't give that away. Um, but here's just a slide, and again, you will get all of these as videos, so you can take the screenshots later. Um, just QR codes for the previous events, in case you want to kind of catch up on them. Uh, we had the railway conversation earlier, so our third event was led by someone who is actually in railway safety. In case there's still interest after today, that might be something to look into. So, just to let you guys know about additional events, the City Council, the Lab, and loads of other organizations, including the University of York and York St. John University, are uh, putting um, some information together on the 14th of March in the Guildhall, only offline, I'm sorry for everyone who's online, uh, but it's covering quite a lot of areas, more business focused, but potentially quite interesting maybe for yourselves or some other people, but again, freely available, face to face, I think it's half a day, so it's a much bigger time commitment. Um, on the right, you can see a list of additional events we're going to be covering. So with the fifth event being on the 10th of April, but more details will follow as soon as I have them. It's a bit tricky sometimes. Um, and the sixth event again on the 26th of April. So we have the dates, we just don't have the final <coughs> information yet. That's why there's no QR code. And end of May, anyone who wants a certificate and attended and kind of checked in will get their certificate. But give us a couple of weeks. Don't email me immediately on the last day. I know this will happen, but I can ask for it. So here's a last reminder. For anyone who wants a certificate, please make sure you scan this QR code. Make sure you have attended three or, uh, more than three of these events. That's the only stipulation around it, more than three events. Scan the QR code, give us information so we can track it. Yes. Is that more than three? I think it's more than three, so okay. a minimum of three events. Okay. So here yeah, it's done three. Including three. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm going to work on my wording. I'm, I'm aware I'm in a law school. I should have been <laughs> that. I'm sorry. Um, another thing we're trying to do at this university with these events is kind of highlighting what other things are happening around campus for anyone who's additionally interested. Because we have some exceptional academics um, who are kind of working on these areas. So uh, Adam was quite kind of enough to put a slide together um, for, for us here kind of highlight the different areas. So I'm not going to claim that I know much about what they're doing. I just try to summarize it and promote it to you guys. So if anyone kind of stands out, feel free to get in touch with them and kind of talk to them about these areas because everyone is really passionate about what they do. Another aspect um, at the university is there are different um, ways to potentially get involved and many different areas of information you might be interested in. Just kind of stay in touch. Um, we're doing a lot of different things, including your festival ideas, but also the Barnes Hale uh, Hall Hale, Hale. Hale of Legal Clinic. And if anyone is interested to get more your bright and Brexit um, information, please feel free to reach out to them. It might be quite common for some of us, but not others. And that leads me to the penultimate slide, where I want to say thank you. First of all, to our speaker of the day. That was incredible. Thanks again. Uh, Grace and Jade in the back, who kind of are the superwomen in the background to kind of make all of this happen. Without them, this wouldn't be possible, let's face it. AV support and catering, Craig is hiding in the back, and I want to say thank you. He's making these incredible videos we can share afterwards, which makes it a lot easier to spread the news. And thank you to Pixabay, who gave me all the lovely images. And me too. <laughs> and you too, yeah. I think we, we agreed on that. Yeah. And everyone who joined on and offline, so thank you to all of you, because without you we wouldn't have these amazing talks, so please spread the word. Um, it's just nice to have everyone engaged. And with those words, everyone online, go on with your day or night, wherever you are, everyone in the room, have a cup of tea, relax, ask your questions, and thank you all. Please continue with your lives. Thank you.